All right. How are you lot doing? I can see some comments coming through already. This is nice. Drasmodia, I do not like your lack of confidence and everything. That's not very nice. <laughs> How are you doing though? How are you finding isolation and working from home? Anyone going insane yet? Or are we mostly sort of sticking with it? Oh no, an error occurred. That's interesting. Can you guys see me? Slightly concerned, but it's on my end and not on your end. Let's see. Can you see anything? Ooh. No promising. Yes. Hi. How are you doing, Ella? How are you doing, Annabelle? How are you doing, Lily? Janabet, Kim, Fatima, how are you all doing? Procrastination is indeed probably your biggest enemy at home. Yes, I imagine. I find also I constantly just eat food for like you kind of get a bit bored. You're like, yeah, probably deserve a snack. Everyone feeling that? <laughs> oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Cool. So welcome to this snap revise. Ah, lack in motivation. Are most of you year 12 or are most of you year 13? Why does it say carbohydrates? That is a very good point. And we're very quickly going to rectify it. So the, what? Sorry, what did you just say? Um, oh, nice. So most of you year 12s. Okay. And there are a few year 13s for in there. I'm intrigued at what, what are you year 13s doing? Are you guys just sort of assuming that you might have to do an exam at some point and you're just not sure you're 12 people i totally understand okay um so what do i know about what's happening with year 12 exams i don't actually have any better knowledge um than what i had the other day when i was talking to you guys i would say there's a very good government document if you go on the government website and type in like exams summer exams 2020 I think there's a really good document that I read the other day that sort of had a good set of ideas for what's going to happen. I'd assume year 12 will be back to normal. Go on, what else are you saying? What subjects do I personally do for ASA level? I do biology, but we also do chemistry, um, physics, uh, maths. <laughs> yes, I feel like if you're in year 12, you've probably got to come to terms with the fact that you will be doing an exam at some point in your life. Year 13s, it looks like you will do an exam if you want to do an exam. Hey, y'all. <laughs> long time no see um i have yet to have more spin on what when you come back yeah no makes sense cool 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 right then guys i reckon time to get started so um what we're going to be looking at today then is and for those of you who are like the first times uh first timers who i assume is um a fair amount of you essentially what my plan is is we are going to be um well i'm going to be going through like one topic at a time so the idea was that whilst you lot are all at home, it'd be a really nice uh, way of making sure that you're still doing a little bit of work, you're still sort of having time with someone who is a teacher. So I used to be a teacher, um, I taught for about four years. And essentially by going over a little bit every day or every every other day in the case for biology and then stamp provided and chemistry as well, hopefully it'll just keep your mind sort of, I don't know, occupied, that's the wrong word. Hopefully it'll just sort of keep you ticking over until you ultimately go back to school or until you ultimately have an exam that you're going to do at some point. So that's the plan. So if any of you have any questions at any point, um, feel free to put them on YouTube, as you guys are very clearly showing me that you are capable of doing. Um, what else are you saying? Is there a link for the PowerPoint? There is a link for the PowerPoint. Um, do you need to pass your, your practicals? So with practicals for um, A-level biology, your teacher sort of marks off that you've done it, and there are things called CPAC assessments, and you basically have to tick off that you've done all of these things like you've demonstrated that you I don't know know how to read instructions and a method and you know how to use equipment and stuff so your teachers will sign you off for that um is this year 12 or year 13 this is year 12 stuff I'm covering today so that's a good point the home study club aptly named which I came up with I partially came up with this name um essentially I'm going to start off with year 12 because that obviously relates to everyone and then I'm just going to keep going until I eventually we'll get to year 13. So when we've gone through enough things, we'll eventually get to year 13. That was, that was my thinking. Um, anything else? Do you need to pass all your practicals for a practical endorsement? Uh, no, you don't need to do all the practicals. You just need to demonstrate that you've done all the things. There's no mark scheme attached. No, um, I'm your mark scheme. Hi. Um, I'm going to go through the questions and the answers with you. Cool. Cool. Let's get going, eh? So, um, just so you know as well, at the very end, and this is going to be the same for quite a few of these YouTube sessions, there is going to be a discount code for Snap Revise. So, any of you who are remotely interested, 
Um, I do lots of other lessons. So I've done uh, one other lesson today. I normally do three lessons a day. Um, so if you like this kind of teaching, if you feel like this helps, then maybe you'd want to sign up to Snap Advice, but I'll let you be the judge of that. So starting off then, I would like to see what you guys know about this molecule. So the diagram represents a triglyceride. Name the molecules represented in the diagram by box B and box Q. What do you guys think? So Q fatty acid tail and P is glycerol. Excellent. Yeah, really, really good. What's this molecule called out of interest? Oh, I says, Dan. Sorry, I was dumb. Uh, yes. So P is glycerol. And Q is a fatty acid. I think that's the nicest my handwriting has ever looked in my life. Um, do you guys know the structure of glycerol and fatty acid? If you were asked to draw what they look like, would you be able to do that in an exam? If you have them in an exam. Yeah? Go on, tell me what I'm missing from my glycerol molecule. What am I missing? There is an ester bond in between them. Excellent, yeah, hydroxyl groups. So there are three hydroxyl groups which go at the end. Uh, what do fatty acids look like? What is their structure? So they have hydroxyl groups too, the fatty acids. That's not quite true. Some of them have double bonds, yeah. Carboxylic group, yes. Three OH groups, already done that. So they have C, Fatima, thank you very much. They have a C, uh, O, O, H. So they're carboxylic acids. So they've got a double bond to an O, they've got an OH. What's the other bit that they have? Someone said they have an R group attached. So all fatty acids look like this. And I would expect all of my students um, to know this. Okay, so that's what your fatty acid looks like with the R tail being quite long and it can be very varied. And essentially what happens is the OH from there is going to react with the hydrogen from there. So you're ending up forming a water molecule. So it's a condensation reaction. You form water, get rid of that, get rid of that, and then you form these ester bonds that look like this. So this is essentially what they have drawn for you sort of thing. Okay, so what you're looking for is COC and then a double bond O or like cocoa or something. Lovely. Uh, okay, so what type of bond is between P and Q in this diagram? I will totally go off on rants and rambles if I feel it's necessary, just to warn you all. Lovely, good. So these are all ester bonds. How do you know it's an ester bond? What did I just say? What are you looking for? I know you can't see it in this and you're taking my word that it's all there, but what's like the really important bit? Why are they lost? Um, they're not lost, they come together to form water. Good, yeah, you're looking for, uh, essentially, there would be an oxygen somewhere here, there'd be a carbon there and a carbon there, and then this carbon has an oxygen coming off of it. So you'd be looking for something like that, yeah? So it's not actually um, the, the hydroxyl group and the hydrogen group, element that are sort of coming off of it, they're just turned into separate water molecules, right? So each one of these will make water. So we could just say plus three H2O, right? That's a condensation reaction. Just draw the whole thing on, can you put R? R tends to be fine unless they tell you what you're talking about. Um, okay, describe how you would test a liquid sample for the presence of a lipid and how would you recognize a posi uh, positive results? I forget that I've sent you the PowerPoint and I was wondering like, how do you know what the answer is so quickly? Okay, so emulsion test, tell me more. I think the PowerPoint's at the top if you have a look. I'm not the one sending it, one of my colleagues is. Maybe maybe if he's listening to this, um, he'll send it to you. Uh, this is AS, yes, Emery. <laughs> Lovely, yeah, what I'm saying is good. So you add ethanol and you sort of shake it about. Um, essentially, when you shake it, that's going to dissolve the lipid. So let's say that. So shake with ethanol. I don't know if it works with other alcohols. Might do. Um, and then you shake it with some water. So you add a little bit of water. So 
So you give it a good old mix around, make sure it's dissolved. Um, the water basically knocks it out of solution, and then you end up forming a uh, cloudy white emulsion. Okay. So it forms like a positive, um, a positive result is shown by a cloudy white emulsion. Uh, you add water in different tubes. Uh, you could do it in a different tube, but you need to add them together eventually. If it's warm, it happens faster. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, white emulsion or cloudy white emulsion, I just put both words in. So if there's any disparity, like it's pretty obvious what you're talking about, if you say cloudy whites, like, I don't know. I'll go for both. It's like, you know, when you did um, carbohydrates and it's like a red uh, precipitate, they like you to say brick red, but it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Do you need to shake it both times? Mm, feasibly, you, you need to shake it a bit just to mix it all together. You could possibly not do it after, I don't know, the second attempt, but I think it's easier just to do that. Uh, this is all exam boards, by the way. I'm doing this for all exam boards. Uh, well, when I say it all, I mean AQA, um, OCR, edXLA, edXLB, then the CIE one and the international edXL one. I'm going to cover a lot of that stuff, but I just don't know those specifications quite as well. Um, okay, cool. So no, ethanol first. It's got to be ethanol first. Um, so the part of the phospholipid labelled A is formed from a particular molecule. Name a molecule. Nice and easy. Should I watch if you do CCEA? Yeah, it's going to be the same stuff. I just don't happen to know the spec as well. What is A? Nice. Not glycerol. <laughs> glycerol. Cool. I think it has a second question which I wanted to put on here. I just want to show you as well how commonly these questions come up, right? It's so it's so it's ridiculous actually how often you get this sort of question come up and there's your cocoa thing up there. Uh, okay, uh, type of bond between uh, A and fatty acid, and I promise you, it's going to get harder in a second. Yep, it's nest bond not to be confused with a phosphodiester bond. Um, okay, which fatty acid X or Y in the figure above is unsaturated? Explain your answer. So which one is an unsaturated fatty acid X or Y? And then tell me why. Oh, there's no phosphodiester bonds here. Sorry, I probably confused you. It has to do with uh, nucleic acids. Okay, so Yes, it is definitely Y. And we know this due to the presence of this double bond here. Now, something weird with some specifications that do this and some that don't, they like you to be even more pedantic than you've already just been. So you want to say that there is a double bond, but on top of that, you want to say which carbons it exists between. Okay, so just so that they know that you're not just, I don't know, making stuff up, you want to tell me um, which carbon number of the fatty acid it is between. So I'll write down what you've said first. So it is Y. And then we want to say something like, um, there is a double bond. I know it's a bit hard to see. Um, you can download the, sli uh, download the slides. Have a look. So um, number one of the fatty acid is starting up here at the top by the carboxylic group, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? I'm pretty sure I've just counted that right. Feel free to double check, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So there's double bond between carbon eight and nine, right? Depending on what specification you do, you might not necessarily need that. You might just need to say, uh, why and that there is a double bond. However, why not, right? If you know something else, if you know that you number them from this way going downwards, then why not say that, right? It's not too much more effort. Um, yeah, I don't know where 11 and 12 came from. But yeah, so between carbon eight and carbon nine, there is a double bond, which means it is unsaturated, right? This one is saturated because uh, it is full of single bonds. Okay, um, let's have a look at this one. So the seeds of some plant species require chilling Exposure to low temperatures. I like, I love that they deem that we don't know what chilling means. Love it. Um, before the embryos they contain grow into plants. During chilling, storage molecules in the seed that contain phosphate are broken down and phosphates are transported to the embryo. 
Scientists investigated the change in mass of phosphate in the embryos of cherry seeds exposed to two different temperatures for 16 weeks. So five degrees Celsius and 25. Um, phospholipids are one of the storage molecules found in cherry seeds. Name type of reaction used to break down phospholipids to release phosphate. Uh, so quite a lot of different answers coming up here. Okay, that's more what I expected. I'm intrigued as well to see some people saying the opposite. So the type of reaction used is certainly a hydrolysis reaction. So it's definitely a hydrolysis reaction. And for those of you saying oxidation, um, when we're talking about molecules breaking down, like big biological molecules, we tend to use hydrolysis or condensation. Now, the trickier part is remembering which one means what. So the way I would look at this is if it's hydrolysis, you've got this word lysis in there. And I, I'd expect every A-level biology student to know that that basically means breakdown. Right? So hydrolysis, um, you're hydrolyzing the molecule, you're breaking it down. Um, if you break off a phospholipid or the phosphate group, sorry, from a phospholipid, that's a hydrolysis reaction. If you're joining fatty acids to a phosphate group um, and to glycerol even, uh, then that'd be a condensation reaction. Yeah, so lysis means to split apart, essentially. Hydro means water as well. So this also happens to break apart water in order to do this. So you break apart water to put the OH, the hydroxyl group, and the hydrogen at either end um, of your, whatever it is, phosphate group and glycerol. And it also is breaking down the molecule. So two little ways to remember that, I guess. Um, so the scientists concluded that an increase in phosphate in the embryo was linked to growth in um, the embryo. Suggest so two reasons why an increase in phosphate can be linked to the growth of an embryo. What do you guys think? Do you need to know how to draw a phospholipid? Um, I wouldn't say it's the most important thing in the world, but basically it's got a double bond to an O. It's got an O minus, O minus, carbon, and then here's your glycerol molecule up here. So the rest of it's all going to be the same where you've got your double bond coming off there. Um, the rest of it's going to be the same. Apart from you've just got this weird phosphate group on it as well. Yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about drawing a phospholipid. Anyway, so what is phosphate used for? So more DNA nucleotides. What else? More DNA. More ATP. Very good. What else can it be used for? Phosphate. What's a phosphate? It's just an ion like a polyatomic ion. Right, so what else can it be used for? So if you're, if it's suggesting, right, that by cooling down, you end up with more phosphate. What other molecules um, is phosphate in? So um, an increase in phosphate leads to more DNA being able to be produced. What else? It's not using water. Cells is too vague. ATP was a good one. So more ATP can be made. What other things as well? So we've got our two marks. What other things contain? Yes, phospholipids is one. So you can make more phospholipids in membranes. What else? Good, web or weeb, well done. That was something that I was thinking of. So you can also make more RNA. What else? Electrical stimulation, I'm not so sure about that. Membranes. Um, the only other thing you could really talk about here is you could say that phosphates, and this is more for people who are in year 13, you could say that phosphates are needed um, to phosphorylate things. So that could be something else. So it's something like substrate level phosphorylation will be able to be done uh, if there's more phosphate. There you go. Bit of a random one. More proteins. Um, proteins don't tend to have phosphate in them. So proteins tend to have the NCC uh, variable group 
amino group, carboxylic group, or carboxyl, right? So they tend not to have phosphates in them. So yeah, not really that important for an amino acid. Ooh, right. Everyone loves a maths question at 20 past three in the afternoon on a Friday. So calculate the ratio of the mean mass of phosphate found at five degrees and the mean mass of phosphate found at 25 degrees after nine weeks of chilling. How do we go about doing this? Um, what else are we saying? The year 13 is phosphorylation. Yeah, year 13 is commensurate. Isn't substrate level phosphorylation in plants and uh, mammals and animals? How does it mean more DNA? Because DNA is made of phosphate. Phosphate groups are in DNA. The more phosphate you have, the more DNA you can have. Sean, how have you worked that out? Four to one. Mariam, how have we worked out four to one? <laughs> how have we worked out 3.8 to one? You keep telling me answers, but not telling me how to do it. It's good. I'm actually really impressed, guys. Well done. Um, how many of you are even online at the moment? Do I have a list of how many people? 149 of you. I'm seeing a lot of people getting this right out of 149. This is good. Um, right, so what's it telling us to do? Calculate the ratio of mean mass of phosphate found at 5 degrees and uh, 25 degrees, right? This is a really, really straightforward question. People just don't like maths. Um, and then we're looking at nine weeks of chilling. So first things first, then, is I need to know where nine weeks is at. So... Uh, there is, what's that, a gap of four, and there are 10 squares, so each one is 0 0.4, so 8.4, 8.8, so it's going to be, uh, this pen is not very good at drawing straight lines, so I'm looking roughly at that line, right, so if I'm looking at the amount of phosphate, if I follow this along, that is just above this mark here, so it's just over one, and it's two over 10, so this time it's 0 0.2, so I'd say that that's about 1.1, 1.2 maybe. So let's go for 1.1 um, times 10 to the minus eight. And then this one up here is in the middle. So it's gonna be 4.2, about 4.2 times 10 to the minus eight. And then if I'm working out a ratio, what do I, how do I want my ratio to sort of be? What are you guys saying? Eight then two then simplify. You don't need to really do any um, gradients or anything like that. Phosphorylation is when you add phosphate to something. So how do you do a ratio in biology? So you do divide. There's like this standard thing, which not a lot of teachers tend to tell people, right? I don't know why, because this is really important. Whenever you lay out a ratio in A-level biology, you always do it in the format X to one. It's it's always like that. I don't know why it's like that, but they always do it like that. So it's x to one, right? So if they want the ratio of um, five degrees, which was that one, to uh, 25 degrees. Okay, so if I want uh, this one to be first, that can be whatever number I want, but this one has to be one. So I need to divide this by 1.1 times 10 to the minus eight. And I therefore need to divide this by 1.1 times 10 to the minus 8. Okay, so what is that? What is 4.2 divided by, sorry, 4.2 times 10 to the minus 8 to 1.1 times 10 to the minus, divided by 1.1 times 10 to the minus 8? Yeah, the second number in ratio has to be 1. Which one is x? So look, it says, read it. Um, calculate the ratio of the mean mass of phosphate at 5 to the mean mass at 25. So the 5 degrees has to be the x one. Good. So five is X respectively. Um, yeah, five is my X respectively, yes. So it's not quite perfectly uh, four to one, is it? So for this question, they actually allow quite a big gap. So with my number, 4.2 divided by 1.1 is what? Yeah, so 3.8 to 1. They allow for my answer for the number to be anywhere between 
uh, 3.7 to 1, all the way up to 4.1 to 1. So if you said 4 to uh, 4, just 4 by itself, to 1, you'd be fine. Where does the minus 8 come from? It's just because the mass of phosphate in a seed is very little. So the minus 8 is here. But right, but it's just basically all that means is it's not actually 1.1. It's like 0 0.0000000000011 no, 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 grams. Right, it's just telling you a very small amount. Yeah, so 4.1 is fine. So 4.1 to 1 is absolutely fine as a final answer. Anything in that range, absolutely fine. Okay, yeah, if you've rounded it, 4.1 to 1 is fine. But I think golden rule for this is for ratios, it's always x to 1. Unless they say otherwise, it's always x to 1. Same with surface area to volume ratios. Um, okay. So lipase is an enzyme that hydrolyzes triglycerides. Um, a student investigated the hydrolysis of a triglyceride or triglycerides in milk by human lipase at 20 degrees. He recorded the pH of a sample of milk before and after adding lipase. He used a pH meter to record the pH. Its results are shown on the graph. So it suggests one advantage of using a pH meter rather than a pH indicator in this experiment. Not more specific. I know what you mean, but it's not more specific. It, okay, cool. So it makes it quantitative. I like that as opposed to qualitative. All of you saying it's more accurate. Um, I'll give you that. But I think it's important that you understand why it's more accurate, right? So can anyone tell me why it's more accurate? And the decimal places don't matter. Why is it more accurate though? How do you, how do pH indicators work? Why is it more precise? Why is it more accurate? What does an indicator actually show you? Humans can still be, have errors of pH meters just by not being able to read it. Good, yeah. An indicator uses a color, right? So if we're using a color, let's say that this is, I don't know, pH two, right? The color for pH two could be red, it could be dark red, it could be orange, it could be yellow, it could be whatever, right? So if you're using a, an indicator, it's very, very subjective, right? It requires me to assume that the same color um, of, or it makes me assume that two colors are the same or two colors are different. And it in, implies that you and I think the exact same thing. So what I see as bright red, you might consider to be a different color to me, right? So it's more accurate, um, let's say, as it's, is quantitative, which means it has a number involved, not qualitative. Qualitative, which can be subjective. Nice, I think that's a fairly good answer. So that question that's probably more than you really would need to say you did get them off just saying it's more accurate but I, I would never be confident enough just to write that in an exam I'd always go like a bit overkill on what I think is deemed necessary um, okay so explain why the pH decreases when lipase is added to milk greetings from Germany greetings how does sterols link to lipids don't know Subjective means two people can see things as differently. So you might think One Direction are a really good band, whereas I think they're not a great band. So upon hydrolysis, fatty acids are produced. Bonds are broken, breaking down, releasing acids, fatty acids, fatty acids, increases hydrogen ions, nothing to do with hydrogen ions. Because milk is neutralizing, nope, nothing to do with that. Um, there's more triglycerides being broken down. Um, yeah, this is pretty good. I'm impressed. Um, so all you need to say then is essentially, uh, we're looking at breaking down a triglyceride, don't forget. And when you break it down, when you've added lipase, the enzyme that breaks down lipids, um, triglycerides made of glycerol and fatty acids, fatty acid will be released. Cool. 
Oh, fatty acids and glycerol monomers, yes. They are monomers of lipids, which is a bit stupid because they're only made of like four things, but they are considered to be. So more triglycerides are being broken down. Therefore, there's an increased amount of fatty acids, which decrease the pH. Yeah. Don't forget, those of you who don't do chemistry, fatty acids are acids, as that abundantly makes clear. And acids reduce the pH, don't they? They don't increase it, they reduce the pH. How is lipase involved in the question? Lipase is the enzyme that breaks it down. So hydrolysis of a triglyceride will happen anyway. Um, but if you add lipase, it happens quicker because an enzyme is a catalyst. Yeah, lipase is just an enzyme that breaks it. Why does that mean the pH increases? It doesn't, pH decreases. So um, the more, the lower the pH, the more acidic it's getting, right? The more fatty acids you have, the more acidic it is, lower the pH. Um, okay, so just why it remained constant after two minutes. So at this moment here, it remained constant. Why is that? So triglycerides are broken down, substrates are used up, no more products, no more enzyme activity, no enzyme. Oh, I like that. Enzymes denature. And if you could tell me why that could happen, that'd be interesting. Uh, why is the guy in Snap? Whoa, why is this guy in Snap provides adverts? Who is the guy in Snap provides adverts? Oh, I see. He is not me. Um, not reached optimum. All the lipids have been used up. Estevons are bright. Nice. Triglycerides are broken down. Limiting fats, no more substrate. Reaction is complete. Okay, there's some things, something that you haven't quite said yet, or most of you haven't said it yet. So, Oh, no. Some of you are now saying it. So, okay. So, it's just why the pH is remaining constant, right? So, let's say that I've got 100 triglycerides, Tg, that makes sense. And by the time I'm getting down here, both 100 triglycerides have turned into 300 fatty acids or something. Right? So, just why the pH is going to remain constant, uh, we could say all of the uh, triglycerides have been used up. or have been hydrolyzed. Okay, so all of them have been used up. Um, we haven't quite explained why the pH is remaining constant. So the thing that maintains the uh, pH, or the thing that's gonna keep it the same is what? So all of the substrate's gone, and therefore, anyone? So what, so no more fatty acids are being released, exactly. So suggest what's happened to the pH. All of these triglycerides have been turned into uh, fatty acids. So therefore no more fatty acids can be produced. Those of you who were, cause I, I don't know if this would necessarily pop into my mind, but the more acidic it gets, like yeah, there's obviously no scale down here. If this was getting down to, I don't know, three or four, uh, or maybe two or something even lower. Uh, lipase could also denature too. So lipase may have denatured, which would also be a good mark, which possibly most people wouldn't think of. So no more enzyme substrate complexes or anything like that. Okay, so that'd be a good way of saying that. Uh, yeah, so someone said there. So no enzyme substrate complexes. No more products. Yeah, exactly, nice, very good. Um, okay, so the student carried out his experiment at 20 degrees. He then repeated the experiment at 15 degrees. Draw a line on the graph to show where you would expect it to be at 15. I know you can't do that before anyone says, oh, I can't do that. Uh, can you describe what it would look like? Below or above? Yes, they are basically the options. Slightly lower. Can we write ESC instead of enzyme substrate complex? Absolutely not, Abdullah. Definitely getting the habit of writing enzyme substrate complex. I'm just being lazy. Lower, slower rate. I can't do that. I was waiting for that. Less steep gradient, lower, lower, above, below. It would take slightly slower. Less steep and below, less steep. Take longer, lower, lower, below, less steep. Okay, so if it's below, right? So let's say we're going to start at the exact same point, aren't we? So we've got to start there and we've got to finish there. Right, so your options are 
So I'm going to be coming below and finishing roughly there. Um, in fact, let's let's go a bit. In fact, it's got to finish there, doesn't it? So it's going to just come down and then it's going to get to that point. Or it's going to be um, slightly different. Let's change the colour to make it slightly different. I'm feeling a light green. Start there. Come down and then eventually it's going to reach the same plateau point. Right? Think really logically about this. If it's this line here, then we're actually saying that the pH of a milk is changing more quickly, right? If it's below, because it's got to end and start at the same point, ultimately, that would actually mean it's quicker. So if I'm cooling it down, it's actually going to be slower. So if I call it down, there is less kinetic energy, which means fewer um, successful collisions, fewer enzyme substrate complexes. So unfortunately, um, it's green. It, unfortunately, the line has to be above and obviously I haven't done a very nice line, but I'll tell you what the mark scheme says. So the line has to be above. It needs to uh, reach plateau, which is the, the point at which it sort of becomes flat. So it reaches plateau um, after more time. And apparently a third thing you need to make sure you've done is it starts and ends at the same point. Is anyone upset with that? Could I explain that again? I could explain that again, yes. So essentially, if it's below, then we're implying that the pH is changing more quickly. Right. If this graph, if this um, line is coming below, then it's actually steeper. So if I want it to be a shallower gradient, then I need to have it above. If I have it below, it's just going to be steeper. So it needs to be above because if it's below, the change is quicker and therefore you've got a greater change in rate. And that's not what we want. Uh, Vmax is the fastest rate an enzyme works at. Uh, at this point here, there, it's not really working at all. So you couldn't say Vmax, you'd have to say plateau here. In the exam, would I draw the line in pen or pencil? Probably a pencil. Unless you don't trust your examiners to rub out your answers and make a mistake. But no, I'd probably use pencil. Uh, okay, cool. So the structure of a phospholipid molecule is different from that of a tri uh, triglyceride. Uh, explain how a triglyceride or a phospholipid is different. Don't know why I started reading another wrong question there, but yeah, sensible to be in pencil, I'd probably say. Okay, so fatty acid has two tails. Fatty acid only has one tail. Phospholipid has two tails. Phospholipid has two tails. Triglycerides have three, yes. Double membrane, I don't know what that's about. Phospholipid has two fatty acid tails, yes. Uh, unknown twins replace one fatty acid with what? Two fatty acid tails, hydrophilic region, phosphate group on glycerol and and very good. Uh, phospholipid has phosphate group, giraffe. Yes, I will read out your silly answers. Ha ha ha. Um, one phosphate, good, right. Okay, so um, you need to be fairly pedantic with this. So the structure of a phospholipid molecule is different from that of a triglyceride. So for two marks, you need to be very specific with what it is. So a triglyceride. Don't know why I've got two eyes there. Definitely shouldn't be two eyes. Hang on. I'll do it again. So I just, I'll just write a sentence again. Yeah, don't trust my own handwriting. Triglyceride has three fatty acid tails. And then with biology, with A-level biology, you need to be able to say um, that this thing has this, whereas this thing has this, right? You'll never get a mark if you say, uh, triglyceride has three fatty acid tails. That won't get you the mark. Um, so you need to say, whereas um, a phospholipid has two fatty acid tails, and one phosphate group. Okay, um, those of you who were saying that a phospholipid 
Shepherd. So those of you that know what I'm talking about, you've got your, in fact, all of you know what I'm talking about. You've got your um, phosphate group head, which is the hydrophilic bit. And you've got your fatty acid tail, which is hydrophobic. I think a lot of people in this question would ultimately say that this molecule is polar because you've got this difference in charge. Um, whereas they'd say that a triglyceride uh, is non-polar and can't dissolve and won't affect solubility or something like that. I think a lot of people would have said something like this, but you've got to be really fundamentally aware that they're asking you specifically for the structure. So when, you're, when you have a question like this, try not to jump in too quickly. Make sure you're actually reading it to actually see what they're asking for. So if they're asking about a structure, you need to say what specifically is different. If they're asking about the function, then you can say about a phospholipid being used in membranes, triglycerides being energy storage, and then maybe properties as well, something like that if you needed to. Uh, okay, I think this might actually be the last question, which I don't know how we've quite got through this so quickly, but I'm fine with that. Um, so a triglyceride is one type of lipid. The diagram shows the structure of a triglyceride molecule. Okay, so here we've got this sort of cocoa thing again. So CO, um, this oxygen here is actually doubly bonded there. I don't know why we've drawn it like that, but anyway. Um, a triglyceride molecule is formed by condensation. From how many molecules is this triglyceride formed? Uh, no, you can say fatty acid, that's fine. I was waiting for someone to say three. Mostly saying four. How confident are we with three and three or four? How's it for? Exactly, Seth, how's it for? No, the answer is 100% for. Um, so how many molecules is it formed from? One, two, three, four, there you go. I don't know why I wanted to put this in. I wanted to see if anyone would like get caught out from this. So a triglyceride molecule is formed by condensation. How many molecules is it formed? Everyone immediately thinks three because you can see three things here. You can see tri, but everyone forgets about glycerol. <laughs> I don't know why they thought that was a good question, but I guess, I guess this is the sort of question that catches people out um, who maybe aren't necessarily expecting to have such a basic question put in. Okay, right. So there is some stuff done on lipids. I do, why 3.5? 3.5, no, not 3.5, one, two, three, four. Anyway, um, I do need to now walk you through a bit about SNAP Revised. So obviously I am giving you a nice free lesson a nice free little thing about lipids. I will, however, um, try and tell you a little bit more about my company and basically what we do. So if any of you who are remotely interested, and I know that that's everyone, I know that. Um, basically, Earthsnap Revise, obviously we're doing a few lessons um, each week on YouTube. However, there is a lot more which you could have if you were to sign up. So if I just very quickly show you A-level biology for AQA because it's at the top, Essentially, what SNAP Revise is, is it's a means for you to do a lot of revision. So not only are there web classes, well, look, here are my web classes that I do. If you look at the schedule at Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I do drop-in sessions where people just ask me questions at Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, all over the place, right? Um, not only do we have lessons, which I will be teaching, and it will literally be me, it won't be anyone else. You know who I am, you know what my teaching's like, hopefully, and hopefully you think it's not terrible and a waste of your time but essentially what we've got is that we've got loads of videos and we've got loads of like really really complicated um sets of things that are there to assess you so we have like quizzes that basically tell you how you're doing um at the start oh i just skipped my quiz i didn't mean to do basically snap revises is like a tool for you to help you work out um, what you know, so there are questions that you'll do, which will show you, and I totally did that randomly, I got it right, two in a row, randomly right. Oh, damn. Um, but anyway, we'll assess you on what you know, and then after you've been assessed, we'll basically have a whole load of videos that will turn up on your um, page, basically telling you what you clearly don't know. So apparently, I don't know any of this stuff, and I do know some of that stuff. And then look, everything in orange is stuff that clearly I don't know. So it loads up a video for me, uh, you can go through it and basically learn some stuff from, hang on, that guy who is lovely. And basically, as part of a snap revised person um, or like as part of a package, you can like write messages on here, like I don't get this, and then I'll get the message and I can reply to you. 
Okay. Um, on top of that, look, we also have these exam packs. We've just got loads of exam questions, just continuous exam questions where the solutions come up so you can go through them. Um, we've got hard ones as well. We've got revision guides where, let's look, there you go. You can download all of these revision guides, which you can then use for your revision. And they're all based on your spec. So it's different for AQA, Edexcel, OCR, whatever. So this is what SNAP provides. So for any of you that are remotely interested, I've got a discount for you coming up in a second. But genuinely, it's, it's very, very good. I know I'm obviously biased. And you know I'm biased. But for what you get from it, um, in terms of you get basically a teacher, me, and you get all of these videos to help you learn, I feel like it's really, I don't know, one of the best things you could possibly have, especially now that everyone is at home. Okay. Um, if that's not enough, if I haven't sold it to you, then please feel free to carry on coming to our YouTube sessions for free. So we're doing um, five a week, apart from next week, I think it's only going to be four because on Friday, I've got a big seminar thing that I need to prepare for and get ready for, which is over the weekend. Um, but we're basically doing something every week and hopefully this will help you. Even if you just watch your YouTube videos, hopefully that'll be enough to help you do well in your uh, A-levels. But if you do want more help, then um, I would recommend Snapprovise to be the thing to help you, okay? So for those of you, oh, I'll answer any questions in a second, actually. For those of you who want this 10 pounds off, here is a voucher. Otherwise, I'm gonna have a look at some of your comments and see what you're saying. What are you saying? Do, 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 do. Can I attach a mark scheme for this? No, I told you all the answers. Why do you want a mark scheme? Uh, yeah, so there's like different versions. So there's like a premium version. Um, there are, I don't know, what is it? So there's the ultimate package, which is the most expensive one, which has me as a tutor. And you'll have about, what is it? I think at the moment we're doing, a, we're, we're doing two lessons a day on our platform. And then it's probably going to be going up to three in a, about a week or a couple of weeks time. So you'll end up having, what is that? Two, four, six, five, ten. So you have at least 10 hours uh, revision with me as a person being around, which will be going up to 15 hours um, with me, which would be pretty good. But yeah, it is pay monthly. So there are some cheaper plans as well. Um, the cheaper plans, hey Ryan, the cheaper plans are, um, I don't know, you get a bit less for them sort of thing. So you'll get access to like the exam down questions and you'll get access to i don't know some of the revision materials but you won't get access to other things yeah have a look so not free no no because this thing above my head which is a roof i want to keep it there and i i can't we can't make money if everything's free so we're going to do some free stuff but not everything's free huh yes you cannot expose the code because i took it off uh yeah the session is done though so what is waterproof then what is waterproof then where things are waterproof how do I have a seminar on Friday? Good question. It will be an online seminar. Is it one-to-one? -one? Uh, no, it's not one-to-one. -one. So it, we ha I have, I don't know, so many students in my classes. So it's smaller than your classroom would be um, probably at school, unless you go to a very small school. But yeah, it's not one-to-one, -one, but it'll, it'll be like this. But as opposed to there being, how many of you are there here? As opposed to being like 150 of you, they'll be like considerably less. Or fewer. Maybe not. Maybe maybe if all of you sign up, maybe I'll be 150 of you. Uh, when is the future biology study club? Um, so the YouTube sessions that I'm doing the study club are going to be on uh, Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Awesome. Right. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so, guys, I reckon I'm going to call it a day there. So have a really lovely weekend and I will catch you at some point in the future, probably on Monday, I guess. So have a really nice time. Um, I will... Hopefully see you guys soon. Goodbye.